Welcome to The Buzz. There's always projects going on in the preserves, and there's some exciting work being done on the Veterans Memorial Trail extension we would like to look into. Then we'll be touring the DuPage River to enjoy a paddle and see how the river has changed since the Hamill Woods Dam removal last year. So join us as we check in on our progress on this episode of The Buzz. preserves have a lot to offer the communities, not only by protecting natural spaces to make them healthy ecosystems, but by also providing the public amenities. One of the most popular amenities is our 130 mile trail system. Whether you're a biker or a hiker, there are so many places to explore. Find a natural escape on our dirt trails, go on a horse ride on the limestone crush trails, or bike for miles on the paved ones. Better yet, we're always planning for the future to make these trails longer and connect them to more communities. Today's project is the Veterans Memorial Trail. Currently, it spans from Romeoville to Woodridge, and it connects with the Centennial Trail that follows along the Plains River, and it connects to the Southern DuPage County Regional Trail that goes further north. Now the plan is to connect it further southeast. Surveying and vegetation removal started last October, but the work is ongoing to connect a 3.5 mile section to the Spring Creek Greenway Trail in Hadley Valley Preserve to a state-owned trail along 159th Street in Lockport. This also includes adding two pedestrian tunnels under Bruce Road and 167th Street. Joining us today to give us more insight on the project is our Chief Landscape Architect, Matt Novander. Matt, can you tell us how long this project has been in the works? Well, this project has been in the works for about uh, 20 years uh, within wow. the Forest Preserve itself. Uh, it originally started, though, as the southern extension of the Veterans Memorial Tollway. Mm -hmm. um, that was originally part of a transportation bill that was uh, established in 1962. Um, but going through all the public uh, meetings and approval processes with that, it was uh, identified that there would like to be a, uh, a trail request through the corridor, right? So when that happened, the tollway set aside a 15 to 20 foot um, corridor within uh, the improvement. And the Forest Preserve has basically acted as the lead agency uh, from the initial onset. This is such an important connection to make because it's a regional transportation corridor, right? So a lot of ours are strictly recreational trails, but this is gonna connect multiple municipalities lots of residents when it's officially opened and tied into. Um, but it's connecting one of our major systems at Spring Creek Greenway Trail to the 159th Street Trail and acts as a conduit for those two things. But it's the beginning of the building blocks for all of that. Eventually it'll get up to Lamont, and then we'll get over to Romeoville, and once you get into that, you can basically get on a bike from New Lenox and get all the way into downtown Chicago. But there's other projects that are planned in the future too that this is going to connect up with. So with the Spring Creek Greenway Trail, you can get into Pilcher Park. And then the future is, is that they're going to upgrade Gauger Road. That's going to have a path uh, that's adjacent to it, which will connect directly in with Old Plank Road Trail. And from there, you can go almost to Indiana. So regionally, it, it's a massive system that we're connecting up. There is a master plan for Will County bikeways. Which sections um, qualify to get to the top of the list? So we're opportunistic in what we do. Um, obviously there's corridors throughout the county that have been identified through the 2040 transportation plan. And when those become available with partner agencies as well as with other construction activities going on and when funding becomes available, those are the ones that we pounce on and we try to gather other local agencies and other support groups to help us along the way. Connectivity between the count, our county and other counties as well as all the municipalities is what we do at the Forest Preserve. It's why we come to work every day and it's what makes our communities better and strong. So with most of our capital projects we try to offset the amount of local dollars that it takes to build these infrastructures. There's programs that are set out there specifically for these sorts of things. Like the Transportation Alternatives Program is exactly what this is intended to pay for. So the way that the grant structures work and the ones that we apply for are usually an 80-20 split, meaning that the granting organization pays for 80% and then the local is picking up the remaining 20%. 
doesn't always work out that way, but those are the ones that we shoot for. Um, on the engineering side of it, we've got multiple uh, grants from uh, federal transportation bills, usually in omnibus packages. Um, and then on the northern section of the Veterans Memorial Trail that's already been constructed, uh, there was a IDNR bikeway grant as well as an ITEP grant that we received in 2009 and 2011. From the construction of what's going on right now, uh, this money is supplied through uh, CMAP. And in total, the construction costs to get from Spring Creek Greenway Trail, which is the southern section uh, that we're meeting up with, to the northern section at the 159th Street Trail, um, is $6.8 million in total, uh, where we sit now. And about $5.8 million of that is in uh, grant funding. This project includes two pedestrian tunnels. What goes into deciding to pick a tunnel? Well, with these, it was either get up and around the roadway and um, have a mid-block crossing or create a throughway. Um, and since this is a major transportation corridor, uh, the idea was is to make the throughway first and then allow for the local connections to come off of that when they become available. So the roadways that we're going through, there isn't really pedestrian accommodations on them now. Mm -hmm. But I guarantee once this thing is open, there will be pedestrians. More will come. <laughs> More will come, exactly. Was there any like wildlife considerations? Like with these tunnels, could these be like migratory helpful, you know, for them for they, turtles they and They actually do function as migratory uh, throughways. Um, these aren't specifically designed for that, mm -hmm. but obviously they're large enough to accommodate to those accommodate uses. Somebody. Yeah. Um, and then the way that the uh, control fences um, are installed with the tollway, it'll keep, hopefully keep the, uh, the animals off of the toll mm -hmm. and then into the open space and use the, the tunnels, yeah. So this, we have lots of different trails in the Forest Preserve, dirt, limestone, crush, and asphalt. What makes you determine this one's gonna be asphalt? Why do you choose that? Well, with this one, going back to the transportation use, um, the expected use of this is going to be hard sighted. People that mm -hmm. want to go long distances, want to go fast, use it as a transportation corridor. Asphalt leans itself best for that. When we go with the limestone screening routes, that's more for an equestrian purpose or mm -hmm. for uh, folks that are doing light jogging and that sort of thing. So this project will be complete uh, this year in October of 2022. And after this, we're going to continue doing uh, the phase two engineering of the, the rest of the Veterans Memorial Trail. So in total, the build out should get us from Silver Cross Hospital in the south, all the way up to 127th Street in Lamont, and then over to Snyder's Passage slash Centennial Trail in Romeoville. Uh, the whole system should be about 15, 15 and a half miles. Um, and once we start applying for more construction dollars to levy local funds, um, we'll have a more firm schedule of when those are gonna be anticipated to be built. But this should be open here for use in fall. These trail connections are so important to us to provide a network of paths for residents to use for recreation and also give them an environmental option to travel to work, local shops, and more. Biking promotes a cleaner air and improves your health by giving you a daily dose of exercise. Check out the Veterans Memorial Trail, our 11 regional trails, and the tons of preserved trails around the county. Do you want to do more to protect nature, inspire discovery, and connect people with the great outdoors? You can when you support the Nature Foundation of Will County. This nonprofit charity raises funds through support from donors, organizations, and the business community to help support the Forest Preserve District of Will County's mission. The foundation helps various initiatives take flight. It helps the Forest Preserve secure national touring exhibitions. It pays for new amenities such as campground welcome stations and bike repair stations on Will County's regional trails. It assists with the costs associated with land stewardship, which includes equipment for volunteer workdays and seeding of native plants to restore the land to its original state, which helps enhance not only your outdoor experiences, but local wildlife as well. 
There's a lot more work to be done, and we're just getting started. Roll with us on this adventure and become a champion for nature so future generations can appreciate and explore everything Mother Nature has to offer. Donate today at willcountynature.org. Last year we covered the Hamill Woods Dam removal. We talked about how it was actually removed and the benefits it would bring to the DuPage River. Now we're back to paddle that stretch to see what kind of changes a year can make. It's always smart to have a plan while kayaking, especially on rivers. Make sure you share your launches and estimated time on the water with someone. Today we're starting at Electric Park in Plainfield and ending in Hamill Woods at the Route 59 access launch. Another important thing to check is the water levels of the rivers you're traveling. Just because you didn't get rain in your town does not mean the river isn't getting water from neighboring towns. Check water.weather.gov to check these river levels. After you shared your plan, now it's time to pack up. And the number one thing is always wear your life jacket. No excuses. It's also recommended to have a whistle attached to your jacket as an extra safety precaution. Joining us on a little adventure today is Jennifer Hammer, who is the Director of Watershed Programs and has worked with us with the Hamill Dam removal and a lot of other watershed projects. Thank you, Jennifer, for joining us. What is like your day-to-day -day being the Director of a Watershed Program? Unfortunately, a lot of my time is in the office, so I am really uh, thankful to be out here on the river with you guys today and to be able to paddle uh, down sections that we're actually working on uh, some future projects on the DuPage River. Uh, but I work a lot with our municipalities and partners like the Forest Preserve District. Um, and we do, we coordinate water quality monitoring. So we have crews out that, that look at the water chemistry, look at fish and bugs, to be able to show that the projects that we're doing are uh, effective and are showing some results. Like we definitely expect to see more fish and insect species moving upstream uh, now that that dam has been removed. Well, let's just talk about what a watershed is, because when I talk to the public, sometimes it can be a little confusing on how it's all connected. It's true. Um, so basically, a watershed is just an area of land that drains into a particular body of water. Mm -hmm. So it could be at a lot of different scales. It could be, you know, the watershed of, of a small wetland. And so all the area that drains into that wetland when it rains and, you know, water flows downhill, and that's the watershed area of that wetland. And then we could look at larger scales, like, there's many tributary small streams that come into the DuPage River. And then looking at a at like the DuPage River watershed, the whole DuPage River watershed, which would include the east and west branches of DuPage, the main stem. Um, that's over like 300 square miles of land area that, that drains into the DuPage. And we all live in a watershed. So water that falls on your property flows downhill and eventually makes it to um, to a stream, a river. Uh, so we're all part of a watershed, whether we live next to the stream or not. And so the things that we do at home, uh, at our businesses, on our way to work, all those things can have impacts on the watershed and they can be good or they can be bad. It's always nice to, to paddle along a river because it's, you can be very, the quieter you are, the more you're likely to see. And so to be able to just sort of paddle along and, and see the wildlife, and, it, and it's just such a different perspective when you're on the river versus driving over the river in a car over a bridge. Yeah, one of um, my memorable stories with damselflies and dragonflies is I was paddling and a really newly hatched damselfly landed on my kayak. It was still like undrying, its wings were still curled. So I kayaked the whole time and watched this damselfly like un Pearl yep. and like be able to fly away by the time I was done. It was really cool just being connected like that. We've stumbled upon a great egret. Uh, along the river we've been seeing a lot of dragonflies. I saw some tiny turtles, but here's kind of our first big wading bird. Looks like it's just kind of hanging out in a shrub. You can see the wind's blowing through its long feathers. That's what great egrets are known for. 
They were once endangered because people wanted those long feathers for fashion on women's hats. Now they've made a comeback. They're protected in their Migratory Bird Act. And now we get these moments to see them in their wild habitat. Is there anything about DuPage River that's like special complained to, compared to like this plains or Kankakee or? So, I mean, the further you are sort of away from Chicago. <laughs> mm -hmm. So like as our development gradient changes, uh, where we have, you know, more open space, whether that's forest preserve or park district parks or just open land, our rivers are generally just healthier because mm -hmm. there's a lot of impacts from stormwater runoff. And so kind of the fewer roads and pipes and hard surfaces we have, our rivers tend to be better. All the water that goes down those storm drains when it rains all goes right out to the river. And so the more we can do to keep those storm drains clear um, and make sure people aren't dumping things like paint or used motor oil or even, you know, water from your car washing going down those storm sewers, it just goes down to the river. So by keeping those storm drains clear, we, we can all benefit from that. And the rivers definitely benefit from that. It's fun to kind of nestle by these trees because so many different kinds of animals use it. So when we were paddling up, there was a great egret. There's red-winged blackbirds kind of flying around. I heard a keel deer. And then there can also be frogs and turtles sunning on those logs. So it's just a great opportunity to like pull over and see what crosses your path. Yes, we stumbled upon an uh, immature bald eagle. You might think like, bald eagle? What? Doesn't look anything like an adult. But the immatures are all brown. Uh, he lifts up his wings, you can see kind of white and speckly. These guys will stay this way for about like five years. So it's really cool. It all of a sudden I turned my head and boom, there he was. So you just never know what you're going to find out here. I've been seeing a lot of fish. I mean, yeah, I, I there, guess I've seen quite a few. I, I just feel surprised. There are a <laughs> lot of smallmouth bass. And one of the mm -hmm. things that's a little different about this section of the river, while there's still a lot of vegetation, we've been kayaking over some really pretty deep sections of the river that are easily six or eight feet deep versus, you know, where we were at upstream, uh, where it was only a foot or two deep. So having that, those changes uh, definitely provide different places for the fish to hang out. Lilycash Creek comes in here. It's the largest tributary on the DuPage, on the lower DuPage. Um, it starts way up in Bolingbrook kind of works its way through Bolingbrook and Romeoville um, and comes into the DuPage River right here on the left. So the tributary streams are really important to the bigger part of the river because it provides habitat for uh, many of our fish species that will go up into the tributaries to lay their eggs and spawn. And then the, the young fish will live up in the the smaller parts, the smaller creeks, until they get a little bit bigger and can come back down into the bigger river. Uh, so it helps provide them with kind of refuge and refuge away from some of the bigger species that might want to eat them. Uh, so those tributary, the small tributaries are really important to the bigger river system. So I'm so excited that we're talking about fish today because I feel like they're one of the animals that get a little underrated. Uh, you know, they're not as cute as the fluffy mammals and we don't get a lot of pictures of them, you know, on our Instagram and Facebook. And these fish are so important to the water quality. Uh, they're actually indicator species. Is that right? Yeah, and, and really looking at it's the community of fish. So, you know, the pictures we tend to see of fish are usually, you know, the smallmouth bass that somebody caught or the northern pike. And while those are really good species to find in your river and represent good water quality, there's a lot of other species um, that really help us fill that picture in. And so when we look at, you know, the results of our sampling and the lists of fish and macroinvertebrates we have, there are different fish and different bugs that have different requirements, both from, you know, a habitat perspective, but also some fish are a lot more uh, tolerant to pollution and other ones are very intolerant to pollution. As we look at fish and bugs, it really helps us tell the whole story of the ecosystem and, and what the quality of it is, what the health of it is.
we're starting to pass a more residential area with private land. And I hear the Conservation Foundation is working on a program working with these private landowners. Do you want to tell us more about that? Sure. So working together with the Lower DuPage River Watershed Coalition and the Conservation Foundation, we've been working on this river responsible program, which we talked a little bit about before, about different ways that everybody can be river responsible. And one of the challenges with recreation is really understanding where is public land and where is private land because you know as we're kayaking down the river sometimes it's hard to know and, um, and one of the things that that we just we've been working on and uh, actually brand new so you're some of the first people to see this so we have these new signs that say private land paddle on and we're making these signs available to any landowners along the DuPage River that they can post so it's meant to be really positive like you know enjoy your day uh, but this is private property and please just you know keep going because uh, you really shouldn't get out of your uh, canoe or kayak anywhere uh, other than on public land. So whether it's park district or forest preserve, uh, launch areas, that's the only place that you should be pulling your kayak or canoe out or, you know, stopping for a, a picnic or things like that. Because most of the land along the DuPage River and many of our rivers in Illinois is privately owned. So we want to respect private lands. We have an email, rivers at theconservationfoundation.org, and we can get signs uh, to you. We'll also be distributing them uh, through the communities along the, the lower DuPage River. We've made it to Hamill Woods. The water has changed a bit since the dam is removed. This is where it once was, but now it's fabulous to paddle. Thank you to Jennifer from the Conservation Foundation for sharing her wisdom on watershed water quality and spotting all this awesome wildlife. This river continues going to Shanahan, so zip up your life jacket and continue on for your own paddling adventure. What do you call the flying insect that glows at night? Lightning bug is a common term in Illinois and throughout the Midwest, where firefly is more common in the Western United States. Some people, like myself, use them both. Whatever you call them, in late June throughout July, they'll be out at night lighting up the skies and making our yards and our preserves into a scene out of a fairy tale. We're at Hickory Creek Preserve about an hour before the sun sets to start looking for our fireflies. They really like wetter areas, so wetter uh, prairies, wetter forests, even your own yards would be perfect. Despite the name firefly, these bugs aren't flies at all. They're actually beetles belonging to the Lampyridae family, which means shining fire. There's about 160 species in the United States with about 20 reported in Illinois. Our most common one is called the Big Dipper. These lightning bugs don't come with a battery pack to make the light. Instead, they have a chemical reaction that happens in their bodies. They have a special enzyme called luciferase that mixes with luciferin and a few other ingredients that make that glow. Picture having a glow stick, cracking it, shaking it up to get that beautiful light. Their light is considered the most efficient light in the world. And it's because of that chemical reaction, making nearly 100% of light versus no heat. In comparison, an incandescent light bulb makes just 10% of light with 90% of energy being lost as heat. True or false? All fireflies light up. False. All fireflies may be bioluminescent, but that doesn't mean all adults actually glow. There are some species of fireflies that are active during the day and don't glow at all. However, most firefly eggs can emit a little light and all larval fireflies can glow. It is glow. thought that larval fireflies glow to avoid being a creature's meal, but adult lightning bugs will glow to find a mate. And depending on the species, there can be different colors. So keep an eye out for yellows, oranges, and even light greens. Each species has their own pattern. So a male will flash its pattern and it will know if a female is interested if she immediately flashes back. However, some hungry females are known to trick the males by flashing to get a bite to eat versus a mate. They live pretty short lives, only about a year. 
Most of their lives are spent underground as eggs or larvae. Then the last two months, they're adults, can fly, glow, and then lay eggs for the next generation. So I've caught two so far. It's not even sunset yet, and they're already starting to glow. And if you look at their yellow butts, this one has two stripes of yellow. That's where the light comes out, and that makes it a male. You'll also notice there's a big lightning bug and a smaller one. That's not just a baby lightning bug. Baby lightning bugs are more worms. So these are two different species, one big, one small. The sun has officially set. We are in the woods and it is pretty breathtaking. I don't know if you can tell, but they're glowing all around me. Now catching these lightning bugs are a staple of the summer. And if we wanna keep these bugs safe for future generations, there's a few things that you can do. Make sure to plant native trees and tall grasses to provide shelter. Avoid pesticides and try to be mindful of your outdoor light. Outdoor lights can confuse the fireflies, making them have lower reproductive success. Be sure you're careful when catching them. You can use your hands, but make sure they are bug spray free. Put them in containers with holes and you can keep them for about a day. When you're done, release them back at night so they can get back to what they were doing. We hope this episode sparks some new motivation to try out a new bike trail, paddle a new stretch of river, or try to catch a glowing lightning bug. Map your next adventure at reconnectwithnature.org to find our interactive maps, to find all sorts of new trails to explore. I hope to see you out using these new connections to bike or maybe even paddle to work. But until then, I'll see you next time on The Buzz.